Yes. Toward the end of the war, we weren't shooting any, any aircraft because there wasn't much left of the German Air Force. We had total control of the air. But we were, that's when we were pushing into Germany and we had crossed the Rhine. Patton's Third Army with his tanks was moving rapidly eastward. But all that was happening so fast that our flanks were exposed. Uh, and there's always a danger that if the enemy has enough power to attack your flank and cut through and cut your supplies, that could dramatically change the course of the war. So we were along the Ruhr River, um, and essentially what we're going to do, we're going to act as infantry, you know, if if, if anything happens. So I, uh, I proposed using our 90 millimeters for artillery, and I proposed it to my senior officer, who is a major, Major McGrath, a uh, nice guy. And we went to see the colonel, and uh, he uh, said, well, pursue it. So we called up to the division of artillery. Remember, there was a, a General Timberlake who was in charge, made an appointment to see him. He was at headquarters in a big old German house there that they were using. And we went in and met with General Timberlake, and he asked a lot of questions, and McGrath didn't know anything about it, so you know, <laughs> I just think back at what was going on there. Here was this kid warrant officer, and I've always looked young for my age, so here at, at about 20, 20, 21, I probably looked like I was 15 years old. And so uh, General Timberlake says, all right, he says, uh, when can you be ready? I said, well, you know, we can have some training sessions this afternoon, probably, and be ready tonight if you wanted us. He said, all right, we might send you some missions. So I remember, I'll never forget, um, walking out of that big house, and there was a bunch of steps going down stone steps, and as we're, I mean, this McGrath was a big guy. He towered above me, you know. As we walked out, he looked at me and he says, Siegel, I sure hope you know what you're doing, otherwise we're both going to be privates in the morning. <laughs> so we got back and got all the battery, there are four batteries, each battery had four guns, four 90 millimeter. So we got everybody together, and I conducted a meeting and handed out all the data on how to use the 90 millimeters for, which was simpler than any aircraft because you didn't have to worry much about wind direction and and uh, the um, air changes, the stratification. Uh, a whole different ball game. So we we went through all that and everybody went back and they did some training that afternoon and and I went to bed that night and I think the next morning I'm having breakfast, McGrath is sitting there too, and we're just finishing up having our coffee when the executive officer who was Secretary of Command walks in and he said, uh, McGrath Siegel, he says, Colonel Odyssey, he says, you don't have to rush when you finish with breakfast. So we looked at each other, what's going on? We walked in and the Colonel said, you know, we got some missions last night. I just got a call from the General Timberlake. He says, he said that was some of the finest shooting he ever saw. Caught a convoy of 150 German trucks with troops and ammunition and wiped the whole thing out. And says, he said, they're all lying out there smoking on the road right now. Mm. So uh, 
I got the bronze star for. You were probably satisfied. <laughs> for military service. Were you satisfied after that happened? <laughs> well, you know, it was a real feather. The Colonel, Colonel Coleman, remember, he was half Jewish. Um, he was a West Point officer. He was a lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. And this was really a feather in his cap, you know, to nobody knew how it all. But f for him to have that capability that nobody else was doing was a, he was just, he was just tickled to death. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. That's amazing. So, yeah. That's the Geschäft. The Geschäft. Do you, uh, do you have anything else to add about the war or anything, life, <laughs> that okay. you would like to say? Uh, no, it's, I just give thanks and how fortunate I've been. I have such a wonderful family. Uh, what more could one ask for, you know? Um, you know, when you ask the question about um, you know, what do you, what do you think about when some get killed, some don't during the war. Well, it's the same thing in life. Now you can, to some extent, make your own good fortune mm -hmm. by your attitude, what you do, how you go about it. But not all of it. Part of it is a matter of muzzle. Yeah. You know, being at the right place at the right time. Yeah. Uh, you know, look at the people who were in 9-11 who were in the towers. Yeah. They, it's just an event that over which they had no control. So I, in all respects, have been very fortunate and I'm grateful and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't give thanks. That's good. And um, I just, now it popped into my head. Uh, do you ever think about the war? Like, do you ever have dreams about the war still till this day? Oh, no, no dreams, really. I'll think about it every once in a while, about some experience hmm. I may have had, but um, I just put all that behind me as quickly as I could. Yeah. I didn't like being in the Army. Yeah. I did as... I gave it my all when I was there. I did as much as I, I could and did it well. I got very high superior ratings mm -hmm. all the way through, but I never liked it. Yeah. I just didn't like being in the Army. It was yeah. too confining and too limiting. Yeah, that's true. I felt the same yeah. way. <laughs> okay, so... We, uh, okay. we wanted to add from us, from me and my dad, uh, that we love you and that we respect you and that we are so grateful you're still alive and that you're with us. Well, thank you very much for, <laughs> and, for the good thoughts. <laughs> yeah. and that's it. Bye. <laughs>